Hello, everyone. It's six o'clock. It's another CMO, great maestro masterclass. And this time we have really a great maestro and a great friend. Sebastian Lang Lessing is, uh, I, I have to give a lot of credit to him because he gave me my first engagement in, in Europe. You remember this, don't you? Of course, uh, I do remember When that. he was music director in um, Nancy, uh, Sebastian said, okay, John, come and conduct. And I made a concert by his invitation. It really started my career in France. And I ended up a music director of a national orchestra in France. So I owe it all to, to Sebastian. And um, we have a good group of people already coming on. And more and more are going to be admitted as we progress. But this is a very special opportunity to have Maestro Sebastian Lang Lessing with us. Some of you know him already from master classes. Others uh, do not know him, but know of him and of his great reputation and success. Music director, not just in Nancy, but also in San Antonio for many years. In Tasmania, he was such a yeah. devil he is. And um, now he's music director of the Korean National Opera. Um, we are thrilled to have as one of the CMO great maestros, uh, Sebastian Lang Lessing. Sebastian, the podium is yours. We're going to be talking about Beethoven's Fidelio and its many overtures and why there are so many overtures, which is a fascinating discussion to itself. You could write a whole book about that. Mm. And we know that there are some dis there are some recordings of all the different overtures, but it might be interesting for you to share some insights about the overtures. And yeah. in general, talk about the Fidelio production that you did do in Seoul, which was really quite a remarkable production, uh, especially it, taking into consideration what was happening during the in the world with COVID, how you adapted um, the production in a way to make it more uh, um, flexible and feasible for an international audience. And last but not least, I want um, us to talk a little bit about Beethoven, the, the great... Beethoven, probably the great muse for us all, and uh, why Fidelio was so special, being his only opera. And why was it his only opera? Maybe you can give us a lot of insights about all of this. Yeah, we can come to that. Um, I think I think he gave, he gives us an answer to that. Actually, why it was his only opera. Um, I mean, he 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 was very impressed with Mozart's Magic Flute, and at the invitation of Schikaneda, who wrote the libretto for the Magic Flute, he started writing an opera for Theater and Davin. Um, which was actually called Vesta Foyer. Uh, so it had nothing to do with this. Then Chicaneda got fired from his position, but Beethoven then discovered um, the sujet of Leonore, uh, L'amour conjugal, or the, uh, the triumph of marriage. It's, um, it's, it's then when he started working on Fidelio, and then it took the whole thing, what he calls his materium of opera writing, started course because it was it was also a very tumultuous time uh vienna was occupied by the french before by the turks by the french and then through the whole wars of the napoleonic wars um we ended up in the restoration when he finished his third version so as always with beethoven he was an extremely political artist um every piece of work that he composed is in somewhat a political statement and um, and fidelio i think is probably the strongest and the most direct uh, political statement. It's also very close to his Symphony Eroica, where he basically took out the dedication to Napoleon the minute he became emperor of France and basically betrayed to his uh, um, ideas or Beethoven's values, the values of the Enlightenment and the values of the French Revolution. Um, the sujet that he chose is actually written by one of the judges uh, in, during the terror, the Robespierre, who was actually responsible for a lot of death penalties. Uh, he later on got out of this um, um, and claimed that he was on the right side of history. Um, but we will always see, and that's also the beauty about Fidelio, a great piece like Fidelio doesn't answer questions. It actually asks even more questions about, about whom to believe. Who is the real savior? Is it at the end the minister who, who said, uh, "Ein Bruder findet seine Brüder"? I, we we don't know. We don't know. And it, he leaves it open. 
when we start with Fidelio, so we know we have three versions of the opera. Um, the first one is called Leonor. Actually, Beethoven always called it Leonore, never Fidelio. That was decided by other people simply for the reason of, of um, as we call it um, now, um, um, so it doesn't get plagiarism with the other operas that had at the, uh, the, uh, the name Fidelio. So he called it Leonor, uh, uh, but, um, but since there was other Leonor operas out there with the same sujet, um, they decided to call it Fidelio, which is, which is what it is today. The first opera is three acts, is very radical, um, very difficult, also slightly longer, was not a success, mainly because he had a French audience, those who occupied <laughs> Vienna at the time, and they didn't understand what's going on, basically, and they were not really interested in the matter. And they a couple were months French. Later, <laughs> and they were French, they didn't understand anything what's going on. So, and then with, especially with the German dialogues. And then uh, he got another friend to join him, joining to, to rewrite the text, shorten the piece in two acts. Same problem, not really the greatest success, but this time it was mainly because Beethoven wasn't happy with the way it was executed. There were a lot of legal problems, so he went out of that. And then it took him almost 10 years to come back to the sushi. And 1814 was the birth of the Fidelio that as we know it today, and uh, this is the opera we are mostly performing, but I highly recommend to look at Leonor, especially the first version, because it has a lot of radical, totally crazy ideas in it, which, which are, as always in Beethoven, he reinvents the genre. Which brings us to the biggest problem uh, with the piece. What is it actually? Is it a singspiel? Is it an opera buffa? Does it, is it an opera seria? Is it a grand opera? Or is it an oratorio? Well, the answer is very simple. It's everything and nothing uh, that, any, that really fits this genre, which I think the most fascinating thing. Yes, it is not easy to put it in a box. And that's why it is so genius to me. It, it, is, it doesn't fit any box. It's unique in any way, uh, not only with the messaging, but also with the genre itself. When we come to the overtures, this now comes into play the great symphonist of Beethoven, of course. We all know Leonora III, which is to me one of the, maybe the, of the most important and probably the first symphonic poem ever written. Uh, um, it's super long, 15 minutes. I had always a hard time programming it because if you program it at the beginning of a concert, it just destroys everything that follows. So I like to finish with this piece, N never start with it. Um, I think this is a programmander. It's, and that was the problem of the overture itself because it tells the whole story, including the trumpet call, which of course is something you don't want to give away too early in the idea uh, of the piece because it's kind, it's kind of a plot in the most dense moment of the dramatic development, this trumpet call announces the arrival of the minister. But I think for Beethoven, working on these overtures was also part of the progress in his writing. So what we know as Leonor I is actually not Leonor I, but the third of the Leonor overtures. This Leonor I was written for performance in Prague that never took place and, and also in his lifetime, Leonor I was never performed. Leonor II was the overture to the 1804 and 1805 uh, production. Then the revision, he used Leonor III as the overture. And then that still happened actually in 1814 when it was first premiered because the Fidelio overture was not yet ready. <laughs> He was still writing and, you know, as contemporary music was at the time, it wasn't ready on, the, it was not on the stands, but for the following performance, a couple, couple of weeks later, Fidelio Overture was finally there. So this is definitely the last version. So the big question is, what are we doing as, as interpreters of this work and performers? How, what do we choose? 
I think it's standard today to use the Fidelio Overture. Let me make a very important point why this is so crucial. I said already that, that you know, by having a 15 minute long overture that basically puts the essence of the piece in a very condensed way. That happened later too with Weber and, and Freischitz, but not 15 minutes. It's only eight. It tells the whole story in a way and gives also away a lot of the dramatic scenes in the piece. But this just goes beyond with 15 minutes because actually Fidelio is not such a long opera. It's under two hours. Um, uh, it's one hour, 50 minutes. And so it kind of goes, goes out of this. But for me, the most important thing is the harmonic progression in the piece. So we start in E major with Fidelio Overture, not the C major idea of, um, of the Leonor. The piece ends in C major. So if we start in C major and end in C major, we don't have the harmonic progression that is important for the piece. Also, the, the following number just does not align in A major, you know. Um, so it is, it's a very alien transition. Uh, so it, it sounds very weird, actually. Um, and what's interesting about this harmonic progression is if we look at the piece, how it evolves, the catalyst number, uh, Gott welch dunkel here, the Florestan aria, the beginning of Act Two, probably the most modern and radical piece in this whole opera, is in A flat major. Uh, so we have E major, A flat major, arriving at C major. And for all of you who know Beethoven's work um, very well, you might discover, oh, that's last like the last three piano sonatas, E, e major, A flat major, C major. So for Beethoven, this harmonic progression was something very symbolic. And it's not by accident that he chose these, uh, these keys. E flat major is also a bright key of hope. It's not the arrival, it transcends hope. A flat major is always the catharsis of a, 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 a key that, that kind of puts us in on, you know, on a fork, whether we go there or no, it's never really a solution key. It's not without hope, but it's also not arriving yet. And C major is the resolution of everything. Um, he finishes, you know, a lot of works like this, and especially, um, as, especially Fidelio. So the choice for me is always clear um, to start with Fidelio over to your, but I think that the Leonor III is such an important work that I integrated and I follow the tradition that not, wasn't actually established by Gustav Mahler. It was actually established by Otto Nicolai, uh, quasi music director of the Vienna Philharmonic, um, who put uh, the Leonor III overture at the beginning of act Two, which to my liking, again, would destroy a little bit the harmonic progression. And then Mahler had the idea of putting it before the finale of, uh, of the opera, which actually helps also the set change and, um, and breaks a little bit the curtain between the last duet of Florestan and Leonor on Fidelio. And now that section that I call the oratorio, the finale, which is basically a grand oratorio, the action came, uh, came to a stop. It's the resolution of everything. And it basically is like the finale of Beethoven 9. Um, so putting the overture there like Gustav Mahler did is very fitting. Also harmonically, because we finish on a G and then it continues in G major. And then Another great conductor slash composer had the even better idea in connecting the last duet and Leonor III overture by omitting the first chord in forte and just sliding the G from, uh, from the end of the soft ending of the duet in to the beginning of Leonor III and then this descent 
into the basement of the, the torture chambers. So and that was Leonard Bernstein in his, in his uh, Viennese performance. You know, one of the few opera performances he did and, and, and one of the great recordings, uh, of course, he did. And, and this piece meant so much to him. And I think that solution is something that I'm very happy to copy uh, because I think it's dramatically just mind-blowingly. Uh, it works so well and it is, it gives an op the opera quasi an ending before the oratorio starts. So it, it, it puts also the proportion of the piece in, in the right perspective. So that's my choice. Um, and we have good reference, Nikolai, Mahler, and Elena Bernstein um, going in that tradition. Now, we come to the Fidelia Overture. Um, it is a very tricky piece to conduct um, because the temporal relations are very crucial in this piece. Like, like in all numbers, the temporal relations are so difficult sometimes. We have a very fast start in La Breve, and you want to really go there, and then it stops. And then comes the first thing that is for me, in every production, the most crucial thing, silence. There are so many silences in this piece with the mata on it that sometimes are not observed, but there is where the tension is the most. And this silence is crucial. And then you have a very tricky horn entry. So please don't look at the horns here. <laughs> um, let them breathe. Give them time. Because coming from this forte to this, to this piano chord is super, super difficult. So all these transitions now from this adagio, you need to make sure that when you come now into the next allegro, again, you have a relation between, between the eighth note up it, pam, 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 you know, that it's actually like a quarter in the new tempo. But temporal relations, be careful with it. If it's one-on-one, -on -one, it tends to be boring. There's always a little twist to not make it 100% the transition because otherwise you don't create the tension that you need between tempo changes. So that's an old wisdom remark from old famous conductors, nothing I made up, but... A simple straight relation is never really working and never feels organic. So this is then when the adagio comes, it has to feel into, and that's for conductors so difficult to control because as you you have this slow two and you have a six to let in the orchestra uh, and you have to control it with this with these changes. So don't come with a concept that you don't fulfill because it all depends on the orchestra how well they control themselves how much influence that it meet but latest when you come into the forte you have to go into four because you need that relation again and for the next elaborate which is also super tricky because you have always in 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 this over to you have always people who want to go slower and people who want to go faster and you have to unify them to some degree it's the philosophy of the whole piece right that we're pulling from all directions with different interests, like the whole piece is about this. The Fidelia Overture is a very tricky piece, so don't underestimate it in, in your rehearsal time. And we come to the most important thing for Beethoven, is the Sforzato. Um, Eroica Symphony is probably the piece, especially the first movement, that has the most Sforzatos, Sforzatos ever written. But the Sforzato has always to be seen in the context of the dynamic. It's not for the per se. Excuse me for interrupting. Yeah. There's something going on with your microphone. I, it's a little bit distorted. It, the sound is a little bit distorted. Let's try again. Okay. Is it better now? Yes, it is. Okay. So the take on. care of these swatsatos. The swatsatos, you need to be super crisp. And the problem is to insist on it when you repeat them, it's a very difficult thing to achieve in Beta. Them. And you have to get on everybody's nerves about them. Mm -hmm. They have to be like a millisecond of an attack and then, then release. I want to, don't want to spend too much time in this. It's a lot to do. You know, how do you treat the, the, the brass in general? Um, this opera is very frustrating for the trombone section because they have only two trombones and they sit around a long time. Not the most popular piece among trombonists. So uh, 
manage your rehearsal time in a way that you sent them away. There's nothing worse than having people sit around and getting bored. Yeah, so you need to uh, be careful with that. The, what is interesting now, the opera starts actually like a singspiel in the model of Entführung and abduction. So we have the Spieltenor, the Pedrillo, and we have Blondchen, Marceline, and they have a, have, a, have a humorous duet, sort of humorous. But it goes beyond because you realize that Marceline has different dreams. She, she is actually a character that has much more depth. And what is kind of strange that she, within the opera, she all of a sudden disappears and just appears at the ending, like, oh my God, we forgot almost who she was. Um, but, but we have to give her a, a really shining light in the beginning, and that's her aria, um, which, which is the number two. Uh, but this aria is very interesting in the way it is written. If you look, it is, it's a bum, bum. Bum, bum. Da, dee, da, da, da. So it, need, it needs to be in four because it's, because it's slow and there's a lot of coloratura. And so you, you have to be, it doesn't work in two, though it's written in a two four. Why did Beethoven write it in a two four instead of writing it in a four four and would be an easy commodo, you know? I, I go to a late opera composer, and that is Janacek, who does the same thing. He condenses when something psychologically becomes complicated and twisted, the paper is black with notes. So he uses smaller, um, uh, smaller notes, denser writing, 30 seconds, 64th in Janacek, you know? He goes very, and it looks very black on paper. And psychologically, this is exactly where Marcelina is in this state. Her mind is, is, is boggled and it, it, it's twisted. It would look very different if it was a 4-4 and would not have the same intensity. The big problem in this area, as, as in the number before, and we have that throughout the piece, is you have tempo changes, but they don't, there is now not a possible relation of 1-2. You know, twice as fast, twice as slow, or something like this doesn't work. So the big question is, what are we doing? Are we doing a transition into the new tempo? Or do we suddenly start the new tempo? Now, this is a performance practice issue. Um, the people who come from a performance practice usually change tempo suddenly, clean, cut. The romantic approach is, of course, the transitional approach. And here we are with Beethoven, with somebody who does not fit one or the other. Yes, Josef Haydn was still alive in 1805. But Beethoven with this opera, and like, like Heroica already opens the floodgate to the Romantic era, which already was overwhelmingly present in Europe through literature. Music is always a little bit in delay, but the Romantic idea is there. The Romantic comes actually from Roman, from meaning in your own language, when first, you know, even the, the church was done in Italian and not in Latin. So it's also the idea of a German language opera that follows the romantic idea of being the liberation of nations, the liberation of people. So it's, it, it all goes in that direction. This, this aria is very difficult for the soprano and, and, and tempo choice is super crucial. Um, don't come with a concept without knowing how lyric or how light your Marcelina is, because the casting here is, is very a lot, very a lot. Marcelina is not a soubrette, um, like it might be in a Singspiel situation. It's much more of a rich lyric voice, because we see that, especially in the Tetzet that follows. The piece that is, for me, the most amazing work in this opera is, is the, the quartet. It's a quartet where it's basically everything suspended. And the suspension is in the temples and I'm not so stupid. Sebastian, check your microphone again. Okay. I can I can switch to normal mic if you should I try that? If you like. We we switch to 
what you're well, saying is so, so crucial and it, it sometimes gets distorted. Yeah, I don't know why that, I mean, I, I, I want it to be fancy. How, do, how does that work? Sounds better. I think everybody can Sounds hear. Sounds better. Then, then leave it to this. Go ahead, and you were just talking so, about the, the aria. The court, so we, we we finished the aria. Interesting with all these arias, there's a lot of soft endings where also the question is, do you want to do a calando or a ritalando? I think it's very beautiful to do that because it's simply natural. Um, don't be too academic about it. I think in Beethoven, it just doesn't work with Beethoven. You have to be convincing in whatever you do. Uh, whether you do a ritalando or not, it's not a sacrilege. Uh, I think it, it, it needs to flow organically. The, the quartet is interesting for two reasons. He has violas divisi in due and cello divisi in due. To some degree, it almost si uh, sounds like, the beginning sounds like a viol quartet, viola da gamba, a quartet of viola da gamba. This is what Beethoven tries to imitate. So in some way, he pays reference to the early Baroque here in his writing. This, this type of vile consort from English consort, consort is, is, is what he pictures here. And yet he draws above this romantic, very romantic long lines and intertwined with a very playful woodwind section. So we have within one piece, three styles. So playing around with the idea of performance practice, vial concert, you know, English concert, Baroque style start developing into this romantic long line singing um, is quite interesting. So explore the vibrato, how it should be used, how it should be developed. But the writing is so, phenomenal uh, between the viola and the cellos that you don't want to drain it. You know, you don't want to saturate it with too much espressivo and vibrato and really uh, rely on, on the harmonic intensity of this piece. It's a quartet where nobody talks to the other person. People are not connected. Everybody is presented with a completely separate agenda. Also, even between the two main characters, the two strongest characters, Marcelina and, and Fidelio, two women, and very fittingly today on March 8, we celebrate women, and believe it or not, most operas celebrate women as the strongest characters. That is basically true, I think, for almost every Verdi opera and almost um, every Mozart opera, um, and definitely for Fidelio. It's, it's woman power at its best. Um, so there's no connection between the characters, which makes it very bizarre. And they all talk to themselves about their agenda, which is hidden from the others, of course. The quartet needs to be slow, but it's super difficult to find the fiato for the singer. So be, be aware of that, that you get the, the feeling of stillness without letting singers die. The, the fourth number, and I don't want to go too much into detail, this is a typical singspiel, um, buffo aria for bass, but yet it is not. Um, because more and more, the more I do Fidelio, the more I am suspicious of Rocco, who is the typical enabler. You know, he always claims he's innocent and he only follows the rules, but we all know that in all cruelty of mankind, it's those people who are the prison, the concentration camp guards, the executors, they are necessary to make the evil work. Um, and he always hides behind, you know, his, his old age, his, his goodwill, and, and, but he's a money person. This is an aria about money. And um, to some degree, I think it would work very well in a, called Vile Opera. As a, it's almost a caricature of it. Um, and um, it is, depicts him in a very strange way. Um, he's talking about, they talk about love or other aspects and he talks money. The, the, following, the following numbers, um, we, we cannot go into all the details. Again, 
Beethoven is always in between alla breve and four, which makes the tempi, um, especially here in the following third set, very difficult to find. You're either too slow or too fast, you know? Uh, if you can start it in alla breve, you will be too fast, but it needs this inner tension. Ba, 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 ba. So also it has to be played on the frog. There is a martelet character in the strings. If it's light, it's not there. The tension is super important. If you lose that tension, if it's too fast, it, it lost it. If it's too slow, it has no drive. There's only one right tempo, but I'm not giving you a metronome marking, but because it depends really clearly on your cast, on the situation, on everything, but be super aware of it. It's a piece that is sometimes in two, sometimes you, sometimes in four, but when you need the control, it needs to, it needs to be in four, especially the start. I highly recommend that. Um, it's, it is somewhat conventional piece, somewhat, somewhat. And it's the first time where Fidelio and Marcelina find some camaraderie here. Now, the big question is, how is it plausible that nobody realizes that, that Fidelio is a woman? I don't think that's really important, first. Second, I also don't think that Marcelina really wants to marry Fidelio. She probably knows, and I've done productions like that, where she found out it's a woman, um, but they have the same idea. They both want to get out of this prison. Marcelina needs to get out, needs to be liberated, and Fidelio needs to liberate her husband. So they, they work alongside. So the character of Marcelina, in all her absence, is something to explore in productions, and in a lot of productions, I've seen that Marcelina comes back and watches what's going on on stage and understands exactly what Fidelio's plan is, which makes it also much easier to understand how she reacts in the finale. So maybe the character is not as shallow as it might appear uh, in the beginning or when, uh, when she all of a sudden, you know, she, she comes on and then she disappears. The march is a very, it's a, it's a typical for Wandlung's music. It's a, it's a French march because it has this double French, and it has a, the double French rhythm. Insist on that, very difficult to execute well. So it's a French style march, very light, very brisk. He does, he does not write a la breve, for example, here. He writes four, but it's a clear a la breve. Uh, again, so, we always hear, oh, you know, beginning of Schubert 9 is written a la breve, so I, do I beat it in two or four? It doesn't matter. It, it, it doesn't matter sometimes. Um, the character of the music is what matters. That whether he wrote it in a la breve or in four does not really define the tempo. I think for me, it's a clear a la breve. I think you also get a more precise attack. But what I'm saying about the rhythm is, overdo the 16th, just stretch the dot a little bit longer to give it a French character. If you just do 16th, it's a little boring. It needs the Frenchness. And I think, of, as we said, I mean, they were occupied by the French. So at the time, the revolutionary idea is with, within that march. You wanna put that in. Now comes the aria of Pizarro, which is a, it's a piece that is super, super exciting for many reasons. But um, the exciting part for me is the male chorus that stand in the background. And again, we have the enablers here who are scared to death of what's going to happen, knowing that they are part of it without being able to do anything against it at their thinking. Uh, of course, they change sides the minute they can. Um, but this, this Aria with a male chorus is also a very new idea, and we have it later on in, uh, in of course, in Freischitz, you know, with the same idea. Um, this male chorus is, is, is spooky. It is, even for the tenor, sitting very low, so it will be very hard for you um, to get great text. 
don't make them sing. Make them speak it first and spit out every consonant. You know, the minute they start singing, they won't be heard. You need to make them spit out every single consonant. And so it becomes something like a ghost choir. I think that's, you know, the idea of the ghost choir that we know from, from uh, Freischutz or the Flying Dutchman is, is, is created at that moment. To some degree, they don't even have to be alive in the production. You know, to some degree, they, they are zombie-like characters. And comes the duet of, of, of uh, Pizarro and, um, and Rocco. Again, we have the enabler who doesn't want to really kill, but he's very happy to shovel the grave for the person. He, he's actually starving to death already. Um, it's an interesting, very harsh sounding um, fa, 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 big question. Do you want to do two down bows? Do you want to do down up? I just want to say again, Beethoven writes Forzado that should answer the question. The second note is, is lighter, but it's very harsh. Use open strings. The open A here sh should resonate. So no divisi, non divisi with the open A string, which makes the ma makes the sound um, very hollow too, which I think is, is, is intended by Beethoven. I sometimes also use in pianos and in tremolos, a little ponticello that gives the frostiness of the color that we need. Um, this duet is, again, a typical example of, of manipulation, how, how easy people can be manipulated. And it's always money. So again, it's a very, I mean, even it's, it might be even a pre-communist idea uh, that is established here. This materialism that leads to everything, you know, throw overboard everything. There is a terrifying chord and this is where your trombones need to be motivated to be part of this action. Um, when pa Pizarro sings in there is a chord that needs to be so brassy like it's out of Chostakovich 8, you know? And, and, and it is such a terrifying chord. And then it says, Ein Stoß. And then there is one of these enormous silences. Und er verstummt. Mm -hmm. These silences for singers are super, super stressful. And, and in all productions, I insist on them being painful. And you know, when you're on stage, everything is much longer. It, one second appears to be a minute. So I said, you, you need to, you need to, you need to count in, you know, you need to count to 15 or something, you know, very far in order to realize now I have to go, keep going. But the longer these silences are, the more powerful the piece becomes. Silence in this, in Fidelio happens to be, because it's, it's also the play of reaction between the two characters. A lot can happen in that moment of stillness. So this, this is a very exciting piece, but we're coming now, I would say, so the quartet is the most important. Now, the next important piece is number nine, is the aria of Leonore. And we have this big difficulty in this aria that it is difficult for everybody. For the singer, because the character, the, the, the voice of Leonore is not, she's not a soprano, she is not a mezzo, she is the typical German Zwischenfach that is born here, um, that will continue in other versions later in the repertoire. Um, for example, Rosenkavalier at Octavianis, this type of Zwischenfach, high mezzo, good high notes, good low notes, more in a lyric style. And here we have the creation of the Jugendlich Dramatische Sopran, which, which usually needs a very good medium voice. That's why it's usually a transition. It's a transition fach. And actually I did it my first, um, I, I did not my, one of the productions I did in Oslo was with Nadia Michael, who was transitioning from Amneris, Amneris and uh, Eboli, all these Italian mezzos, in 
to what became then her signature role, Salome. Um, and, but this was the first soprano part she ever sung uh, because it transitions from this mezzo to the soprano. The, the role itself is not high, but it's constantly in a very tense, dense register. But if you don't have a good medium and low voice, you're in trouble, especially in the, in the slow part of this aria. The other thing that is so difficult in this is the horns. And like in Eroica, he uses three horns. But I beg to differ, actually he doesn't use three horns. He actually uses four and he uses the fagot, the bassoon as one of the horns. Um, because they always play together. Um, it's like a quartet, um, which is an interesting concept because actually at this time, the horns were not part of the brass section, they're part of the woodwind section, uh, the way the writing is, is written. And, and the color between the horn and the bassoon was, with the natural horns, relatively similar, relatively similar. So there was a blend um, in order to make it, because he had natural horns, in order to make some of the passages work and some of the notes he, that he needed in the court work and also some of the fluidity, he used the bassoon to replace an, another horn because he can be more chromatic, chromatic and more agile. So, so some of these agile parts are, um, are given to the bassoon. Be, so be very careful of making sure you have your bassoon close to the horn section here because they have to blend as, as one. Uh, and the balance also needs to be like that, meaning the, the, bassoon, um, the bassoon horn balance needs to be absolutely perfect. Let not the horns drown the bassoon, and the bassoon needs to be uh, kind, kind of powerful leading. In some degree, it's like a first horn part. The first, the bassoon, and the, fourth, uh, the third horn are the most crucial ones here. Again, it is so difficult to execute um, the tempo don't come with the concept of tempo to the first rehearsal without knowing who your people are. Um, depending how the voice is transitioning from a heavier mezzo part into the soprano or whether it is actually a lighter soprano that transitions into heavier uh, repertoire, it's a totally different ball game in terms of tempo, especially in the introduction. But then also later on, especially in the Allegro, you need to be helpful to the soprano. A lot of people think they need more time in order to get through it. The opposite is mostly the case. Get the Allegro in tempo, try to help them go through it. Give you time to breathe, but you need to have a very brisk tempo here. Most of the time, um, that's the only way of getting through this uh, this this allegro con brio because also super difficult for the soprano because you're constantly on the break. The difficulty is between the difference between the soprano and the mezzo is that the break sits at a different position, like for tenor and baritone. She's constantly hitting that break position, which makes it so difficult. E F G. This is why you need to get over it fast and and help them through it. It's it's. It's written differently, difficulty, especially the very ending. It's his instrumental writing. I don't think we, should, we always accuse Beethoven he doesn't know how to write for voice. That is not true. He knew exactly the difficulty of the voice and he made it difficult on purpose, going to that G, which is G sharp, which is not a big deal, right? But going from E, E sharp, F, F, F sharp, double sharp, going to the G um, sharp is such a crucial thing because cruel, it is cruel because you go into the break and all the difficulty of the, of the shift. And then with a coloratura from a low E up to a top B, which is for soprano, not a big deal, but this top B is one of the most difficult Bs written in the, uh, in the whole repertoire. Be aware of it. There are different types of, um, of cadenzas. Don't insist on the top B if it 
becomes an, a burden. There is an alternative version of it. So all these things are super important. Be very creative with your with your singers when you when you work on that uh, that piece. Um, it is difficult beyond uh, beyond belief. This finishes. I mean, this this ending and when that when that B natural by the soprano sits in the right spot is the most thrilling note that you're gonna hear all night. Um, and then comes Beethoven's um, again a new invention. This main chorus, the Gefangenen Chor. Um, there's another prisoner chorus later on by Verdi, uh, but this one is very special because it's only men. And the divisi of the man is is kind of exciting. The way he writes is so fantastic again, uh, because he compresses actually everything, meaning he pulls the tenors relatively down in a lot of spaces, and the baritones up. So the, the the voices come very close to each other. He doesn't take that wide wide range. Again, here he does something that is. You know, from a vocal point, very difficult. Why do the tenors sit on an F all the time? Again, just above the break. So it's super difficult. Be very aware of this as a difficult position for the chorus. You need to breathe with them very well. So here it's also important to, you want to get a beautiful pianissimo, which is difficult, again, for the baritone bass section because they start this. So you have to come from the diction a lot and some of the depth you need to hear overdo the diction um, because you want to get the color really from the speaking, not so much from the singing, because again, very low for the, uh, for the tenors. But when that is sung well, it is, it is in itself uh, the most magic moment. And I have to say, in every production I did, the male chorus gets standing ovation, not, not during this, but, but, but at the end of the curtain call, Everybody recognizes how amazing this is. So if, the, if you don't get goosebumps yourself, something is going wrong. The finale is very tricky in terms of transitions and we don't have the time here to go in all the details. I don't know how we are doing with it. Don't, we won't have the time to go into all these details. Um, you have to find transitions uh, and sometimes the only way of doing it is going with the Bica Cerando, especially before the entry of Marcelina. Yum, pa, 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 pam, pa, 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 because you need to be in one here. And depending on the entry and how far she is away, you need to prepare that with an Ancherando, otherwise it is just easily falling apart. Then there are different things that are not written in the score. There's Frühlings common, for example. It has to be slower. Try not to stay in one and fight everything just because it's not written in a muscle. Believe me, you will give in the minute it happens on stage. It's just those things are not tra tradition because they are sloppy. They're tradition because they make sense from an emotional and dramatic point of view. I'm not going into all of these details because we just don't have the time for it. And if everybody wants to know more, I think we need to schedule that separately, but I'm very uh, happy to do. Um, I just want to say something about the ending of the finale, and that is a little bit like the ending of Wolfschluck. In um, so it dies out, and then the genius Beethoven he writes this timpani. He writes actually a rhythm at the end, at the last chord, uh, which like gives this a not finished scene. It's it's open. It stays totally open. We don't know. It, again, it asks more questions than it answers. The audio of Floristan. So we waited a whole act for, for this prisoner to appear. It's probably the most personal statement Beethoven made in this piece. And there's one word. Uh, we all know that Beethoven lost his hearing uh, during the time of 1804, 1805, he was already much impaired. In 1814, he needed to use conversation books in order to communicate with people. One of the reasons that writing an opera for him was such a big undertaking because he had to communicate with so many people. 
that it was all about communication in this field. You communicate with staging, with libretto, with, with, with producers. It, it's, it's a big undertaking. And it was overwhelming to him at that point. Part of the reason it became also such a materium, as he said, for him. But um, when Florestan sings, first of all, the introduction, I mean, I, I come to that, but of that aria in itself, I think is, is the most modern thing of writing that had existed up to this point and still is today. Um, but when Florestan sings God, and we all know how long this God can be, you know, is when he, uh, again, the, remember the big thermometer in Beethoven, I'm God. Also, usually you need to, there is something in when Beethoven uses God that is not just praise, that is just like, almost like an accusation, you know, it's like, God, why don't you help us? Why do you put us in this misery? That's why this God is so such a big crescendo usually, you know, um, and it can take forever. And it is actually great if it takes forever. But the, we, when he talks about the darkness, that's his own darkness in, in life. But what's probably the most painful thing for Beethoven was when he says, O grauen volle Stille. Because that was the world of Beethoven. The, the world of silence. Um, the, the biggest problem of going deaf is that you are all of a sudden in a world of silence. And this silence can be can give you a lot of anxiety, and it's so it did to Beethoven. So then you hear, boom, boom, boom. you hear this tremolo, and then the misurato. Be very, very careful. These these rhythms are super, super difficult. You go from sixteenth, sixtolet into tremolo, or is it still misurato? You know, um, that is a little question. I go into tremolo just for the color. Frankly, it almost makes no difference when you hear it. But if you have it tremolo, you can you can be a little you you you're going to be more flexible for the following phrase of the singer. It's just a decision to be made. I think it will help you. Um, but this grauenvolle Stille is is the quintessential uh, where it becomes a personal um, affair for him. We also know that Beethoven was longing for family life. He, he actually proposed to women, got rejected. Um, and then we know the, the cycle and defender Geliebte, that there is this love, whether it was from Brunswick or not, we don't know. But, but this is this sitting there in this ground for the Stille and waiting maybe for this woman to drag him out of his darkness is, is also himself, not just Florestan. Um, if you use natural horns, you will hear a lot of um, forte, unisono, especially the E flat, um, as stop notes, which I think is very interesting. Even if you use modern horns, be aware which notes would be stop notes on a natural horn and get them as stop notes because it really changes the color of these wind chords after the piano in the strings dramatically and it's it's a ph phenomenal effect to have this this these stop notes because they're brittle they they are almost like the rattling of of, of the chains of Fidelio so so go for these colors be and I highly recommend that in general with Beethoven using modern horns be aware of where you can actually you don't have to do it every time, but where you can use stop notes in a very effective way. Eroica has many passages like this, which will change the dramatic uh, cause of it uh, in, uh, enormously. The aria is very difficult um, to conduct because it's most of it is a recitative. It's all big recitativo with a lot of flexibility. And again, we have here the birthplace of a new fach of singer. The, classic, what we call the German Helden tenor, Helden tenor. The Helden tenor uh, that we find in Wagner and uh, most prominently 
But here it's, it's the birthplace of the Helgi tenor. It's a dark tenor voice that actually it's not about the ten, the, the it's not about the top notes, but it's the, about the intensity and the tension in the top notes. So you want a dark colored voice who doesn't go with ease to the top. John Vickers was a great example for that, that wh why his performance was so thrilling. And it works fantastically in that introduction. And then it doesn't work in the Poco Allegro, you know? And then all of a sudden you basically want somebody else who is a light tenor who gets through this with ease because going up to these B natural uh, B, B flats there is super, super difficult. Again, you can help a lot by taking the Poco Allegro, not Poco, but good Allegro, even with a heavier voice. They will all thank you by getting through this because um, it sits on the brake. It's constantly struggling with the top. Um, you need to get over it with, with ease and lightness, uh, total, in total contrast to the actual voice type of the beginning. But the voice that you want is the voice of the introduction, the, the allegro, you need to negotiate. I, when, you have a, when you have a tenor who has both, it's totally amazing. And there are now a lot of them who, who have that facility and the darkness, the natural darkness. So, but again, don't come with a tempo concept be before you know who you have. It, it makes no sense. You need to know, and you need to get under the skin of your singer. You know, you need to be a good partner here. Don't be stubborn when it comes to Leonore or Florestan. Um, they need all your help. The next genre that he, Beethoven puts in here is the melodrama. That is also a modern creation. Something he used before in Egmont, uh, uh, Schauspiel music, uh, so theater music. So he used the, 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 the melodrama, but the mix between spoken, interrupted by dialogue, then, then a motif, and then spoken word, then sometimes spoken word on top of the music is a fairly new invention um, and combines theater. So if I use a term for Fidelio, it's the, I have to use a German uh, uh, a term, it's Musiktheater. It is music theater. It's not an opera. It's a real Musiktheater. It's, it's all about the dramatic effects um, and carrying through the message. That's what the piece is about. It's not a, None of the arias is interesting because it's a virtuoso. It's actually sometimes the opposite. It's the pain that people go through technically makes it also th th so thrilling. So he knew what, 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 what he was doing. Also in this melodrama, which is followed by the shoveling scene, which really is, is a horrible thing when you think about how mechanically Rocco, I mean, he's very fine shoveling this grave. And Beethoven does something here that is also very unusual. The contrabassoon for us is a, is a very strange instrument. I mean, it sits there and rings, you know, usually in tutti. And it's the first time, and one of the few times in all of music where the contrabassoon is soloistically taken. It's a big solo for the contrabassoon. So in your rehearsal, be aware of this. That's all of, that somebody who's all of a sudden is playing an instrument that is always hidden in the cloud is becoming extremely uh, soloistic. So let the contrabassoon lead it and the bass and cello section follow the contrabassoon, not the other way around, because that's the interesting color. And it's much easier for them to follow the contrabassoon than the other way around, especially that 16th run before the fermata is a, is a very, very um, uh, difficult uh, scene for the, for the uh, contrabassoon. Make it a contrabassoon con concerto and the, the, whole, the whole thing will be 10 times more interesting. Um, unusual, so bring it out. Um, we have, we have the Ted set and all of this is, is relatively, relatively um, conventional in comparison to what happened before. 
Um, so I, I don't want to go into too much detail. Um, it's very touching and especially the intimacy that is all, all of a sudden. And, and it's almost like, a, it's a very religious scene with the water and, and, and it pays a lot of reference to the Eucharisti uh, in the Christian, you know, in the Christian tradition. So this, this bread, see it all as a metaphor, the bread and wine idea. I think this is what's happening here is, is actually a religious act. Um, so Jesus, you know, reincarnation, however you want to interpret it. The quartet is very tricky because that dramaturgically is kind of always a bummer because, you know, people have to come in and it has to be plausible that she doesn't, that he doesn't see the, the pistol at the end. Um, it's, 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 it's for the, for the regisseur, for the director, it's a, it's a nightmare to stage and to make it dramatically work. Um, you have to help here with a super fiery temple. But again, um, when, when this moment comes to it, erst sein Weib, and she protects him with her own body, um, it is such a dramatic moment. Don't even think about this as in temple. <laughs> you know, give moments like this the space they need in order to get that drama really, um, really the, the kick it, it needs. Um, again, going into that Pio Mosso is super, super difficult. And it's a, the, the ending is very tricky to get together. You need to transition with it. The only thing that worked for me always is transition with a Nacerando into the Pio Mosso, um, but let the strings play down balls. Uh, it's very exciting if you do that. Um, which makes the Acerando difficult, but, but it's very exciting. When the trumpet comes, it's always a question, how should the trumpet play the two calls? What is the difference? Um, yes, it is Pio Forte the second time, but what the rubato is. Um, make sure that there is a significant difference between the two calls. The first one is a matter of fact call, the second one is really giving space. So I would really try to also in tempo to vary it and, and not have them both times do the same type of ritarando before the fermata. You know, it's more interesting if you once go into it and then when you want to do a ritarando that it really is celebrated, but make sure it's different because it needs it. What Because what's following, um, especially the second one has this brutal attack. So the more the trumpet celebrates, and then again, the silence or the fermata is very long before then this sudden abrupt Shostakovich-like start happens. Super difficult. Um, again, we have a, a presto, another presto even faster and, and don't take hostages here. You know, you really, really need to go, uh, drive it against the wall. The following duet is very difficult because it's not written for held and tenor and the Jugendlich Dramatische Sopran. It would be so much easier if we had just two light lyric voices singing it, but we don't. And is it because Beethoven doesn't know how to write for voice? No, because this Namenlose Freude is two years yet they haven't seen each other. What happened to the laugh? What happened during those two years? It's a very awkward moment. Um, and I think this touching is, is a very hard thing after all of this. You know, um, we know it now from, you know, when the hostages come back after 150 days, you know, in Israel, how an overwhelming experience that is for the families. But we're talking years in darkness. Um, so it is not the classical love duet. It is not, it cannot be. Um, in a lot of places I've seen them being actually far apart from each other, which to some degree is, is, is wonderful. Tricky to get together though. Um, it's also try to get it light, but there's one wonderful line is the, the cello that you need to bring out. It's written under, under the long legato line, but you need to break it up because you want the cello line 
underneath being super espressivo. Just be aware of it. Um, again, you probably have to fight with the singers a little bit to get them into a fast tempo and get the attack attacks not late. Um, at the end of the day, they will be grateful for it. So don't give in in the beginning. Be a friend and move it into 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 the into the fast mood that you need in order to make it work. Again, like in lo a lot of pieces, he finishes with a slow tr transition, uh, with a, a soft transition. Now you can do that in 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 tempo, but I think in a romantic way, it's a calando, especially the last cello line going up going on and then if you really look at it it already dear, dear, da, dear, dear. on the g you'll land and then you will start with leonor three over two which is which is an amazing amazing thing to do and actually every director was very grateful when i insisted on having that um and they all loved it because it gives them time for a set change which you need um, because it's a different set. Now comes the oratorio. Um, the finale is in itself an oratorio. And in some productions, even produced that way. I, I, I just want to reflect on the production that I did. And they all had a current political meaning. We did one in Robben Island in Cape Town, um, where, 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 um, where Nelson Mandela was in prison for, for 27 years. Um, so talking Fidelio, Florestan had a short, short term. Um, and, and to do Fidelio in such a location, of course, has an immediate meaning. We did it during the pandemic, which was, we were all in a prison. And my, my collaborator, Kevork Murat, who actually is an Armenian, Syrian, refugee um, who knows that, I mean, has that in his DNA as an Armenian, basically being constantly chased, prosecuted, you know, um, as a genocide, everything um, happened to the Armenian people and then living in Syria and then f fleeing from there. He comes from actually from Aleppo. Now he lives in, uh, in Manhattan and works in Brooklyn, has a studio there. We had this concept, and he wants, wanted to come to, uh, to Korea to do it uh, live there because he paints life to the music. But the, his scale of his work for the projections is so enormous that he could not work in a quarantine hotel for two weeks. You know, uh, there's no way uh, anything is big enough for his. Uh, he needed a studio, which was in the pandemic impossible. So, thanks to technique, we we, we had the files transferred from New York, but they were so big that sometimes the download took 12 hours for one image. Um, but it was beautiful because, again, as a symbol, and Beethoven gets us here, as a symbol, we unite the world across the continents for this piece of art, uh, and we free our imprisonment. You know, we follow Beethoven's message and, and become brother and fight uh, these dark times together with this message. Another production that I did um, was in Oslo, where in the finale, we had a sudden, in the middle of the course, a subtle interruption, a sudden interruption. It was during the Arab Spring, where when in Egypt, there was this movement of the, uh, the Muslim um, uh, Brotherhood, a lot of people were in prison and it was a big turmoil in, in Egypt. And a lot of people were in prison and people were fighting for these people and demonstrating on the street and trying to free them, you know, political prisoners and or religious prisoners or however you call it is all the same. Um, and we interrupted the, this, this chorus and people would tell story, real stories of people who are in prison in, um, in Egypt or in other parts of, of uh, uh, during the Arab Spring. And uh, it was very powerful because it was like, it, at first it was a shock and every chorus member became all of a sudden a person, a fighter, family member of someone who is 
in that situation. And then we got we got um, uh, we got a, a bomb threat. If we do, if we go on with this, uh, they will bomb the theater. And I have to say, I'm super grateful for uh, Siemens and uh, Siemensen, who was the the director, and um, and the whole team for not bowing down to that. I mean, we all said no. We are going with that. We have a little bit of a security, maybe, but if we stop speaking out as artists, it's the end, and Beethoven would not allow that to happen. So we went on with the performance. We were a little scared at that moment, but that's how you should be. What I'm saying is Beethoven is always, always met us in our moment. And for Fidelio, unfortunately, I think we will never run out of reasons to perform Fidelio in the, in the current context of our political uh, life and our being as human beings. So... Eroica, Fidelio, Ninth Symphony is, is one line of, of, of a big message to humanity from a very pers personal perspective as a, as a composer. Sebastian, this is fantastic. You just inspired us in a most incredible way. I haven't heard such a fascinating discussion about not just a musical masterpiece that Fidelio is, but the topicality of the piece, not just how about powerful women on International Women's Day, but the topicality of freedom and, and humanity. Uh, my friend, is there something you'd like to say about the very end? And then we can open it for a few questions and answers. At the very end of the piece, I mean, look, is the for me, the ending is an ending in panic. You know, this minister is coming and he's, he's, he's also, he's coming. He, it's a, just another autocrat that is coming. He's not, they're not going to be free. And the panic in what way the chorus is screaming this fortissimo at the end um, is, is so over the top that I don't think it's pure joy. I think it's pure panic. Um, again, did Beethoven write badly for the chorus by making them scream um, because there's no other way of doing it in a way? Or is that intentional? Because it is not just the triumph ending that would be very simple and easy. Like Beethoven 9, it is not just a, a triumphant ending that is glorious and everybody applauds. Yeah, everybody applauds, but there is always fear in it, you know? And then don't go for the next guy. I think that's the message I hear in the video. Now, don't believe him that he's going to be better than Pizarro, you know? So, um, it's a deeply human piece, you know, and it's, um, there are many performances that, that we had one in the re reunification of Germany in 1898, you know, where Militz had the brilliant idea of all of a sudden the chorus became the people that were on the streets demonstrating in, in Leipzig and Dresden and the chorus. And it was like, everybody felt like, that's us, that's us. And it was part of the reason that this revolution went peacefully. It was always on the verge of not ending peacefully, but it ended because art can also push ideas. We have a political um, role to play, you know, we have a message and Beethoven always reminds us. Bravo. Uh, we have a very um, interesting question from one of the conductors, Anastasia, um, who is giving asking some musical questions from a conductor's perspective. When you have a lot of scales, a lot of arpeggios written in the score, um, how do you avoid stumbling over these scales and arpeggios and look through the scene of an aria, duet, what it might be, to get to the substance of the musical um, narrative rather than being preoccupied by a lot of that black ink on the page. And the second question uh, is a little bit related to this. You're talking about the instrumental diversity, period, string instruments, natural horns. How do you think the conductor's perception of Fidelio has transformed this in the score? 
over the 200 years in terms of the operations with the instruments of the time and using modern instruments now in terms of cues and dynamics? What would be your opinion about both of those questions? I think Beethoven would not care what type of instrument you use. Beethoven would care that you're true with your expression and your message. Um, I find the idea of mixing both worlds actually thrillingly interesting, you know, because sometimes you want the natural trumpet harshness and the natural horn mellowness. And sometimes you want the romantic idea of long phrase this piece does not belong to one period it belongs to humankind so don't be dogmatic about it it doesn't solve the problem of messaging when it comes to the scales um Beethoven gives us a very simple answer focus on the sforzato and everything else let go it's a millisecond and then the um and then the rest is you know you just let go um, there are a few of those that are as perceivable, but then they are slower. And then it is a then it's almost in a Brahmsian way they should be played. But uh, but in general, attack and then let go, not insisting. Also because it's people are running out of steam, you know, especially in the strings. It's a very hard piece to play. Bravo, Sebastian. This has been really. Just a marvelous, marvelous masterclass on such an important piece of repertoire for every conductor, whether it be for the opera stage, whether it be for the concert stage. Um, you know, I've, I've known you for a long time and I've just been fascinated. I, I've sat here just absorbing every single word that you have expressed because you've given us incredible insight, not just into how to conduct the piece, but how to understand the piece. And uh, as you say, this is um, a piece for humanity. And I thank you and everybody is writing thank you to me as well for uh, your availability, for your expertise and for your experience. And as you said, it's such an incredible piece. You need to do more. So maybe we're going to schedule Eroica and the Ninth Symphony. <laughs> so we can yeah, of course. On. And of course, yeah. I mean, so we I said can carry on this conversation. And if you want to conduct this piece, hit me up because that that takes a lot of um it's 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 just a very difficult piece to conduct um it's always challenging but it's always a thrill uh, but beethoven i always have the feeling you know beethoven is very tough with us if, if something doesn't go well i always have the feeling he's hitting on me you know, you know? <laughs> I, always, I say that to orchestras a lot i say you know you know if, if you don't play sforzato i have some i have the feeling that beethoven is behind me and just hitting me with a stick you know because you know he had to move 52 times in Vienna in order to um because he was always evicted because he he was <laughs> and, 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 and well that was a beautiful noise that you've been making for us for the last 90 minutes so Sebastian thank you so much everybody loved it everybody says it was brilliant and we're gonna see you again soon that's for sure Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all you all. Best. Thank you all for attending. I mentioned thank them you very too. much, Maestri. Oh, thank you. Oh, hi, Vera. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.